So Jacob Watson was in and out of jail. Uh, you'd eventually end up in a psych ward as well. Where was God in all this uh, in your mind? Again, you have this Christian background. Uh, maybe it was, as you talked about, maybe not passionate, you know, in terms of in your home. But where was God in this thing, Jacob? So God, honestly, he was always there. I remember there was a point when I was, I was 14. I just dropped out of high school. I was working at, I picked up a job at Canadian Tire. Um, I remember there's a point where I was walking down the aisle at Canadian Tire and I said, God, I don't want you in my life anymore. I'm, I'm done. I don't want anything to do with you. And like I said, there's just this like demonic pull to get really dark and like I want to be angry. I want to be mad. I want to like don't want any love. I don't want anything to do with love. And I remember actually like denying God and rejecting him there in my life. Um, and that actually didn't push him away from me because he always had his hand on the situation. Uh, when I was 16, I ended up in the psych ward and I was diagnosed rapid cycle bipolar. And God wasn't a thought in my mind except for every once in a while because I had this bitterness towards him. If some of my friends were talking about him, I took the opportunity to bash God. Oh, where's he in my life? Look, like, look what he's doing in my life. So you believe in him, but you don't want nothing to do with him. Yeah, because I, I was mad. It's not that yeah. I didn't believe in him. It's I was yeah. mad. So okay. I said I didn't believe in him and I didn't want anything to do with him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And society such, was such an antichrist society that, like, you know, if people are going to make fun of God, then, like, I'm going to too. You know what I mean? And so he was, he was there the whole time. I remember one time when I was sit I went to jail. And when I was sitting in jail, that's when God became appealing to me kind of because I was in a situation and, oh, this can be my way out here. But I remember sitting in jail and the guy that was in my cell with me, he was this big, I'm this little skinny 18 year old and he's this big, tall six foot, you know, he's just told me he just finished doing 13 years in the penitentiary. This is my cellmate and we're sitting there and I was, I was literally just mad. So, um, I forget how we got on the topic, but I was like, man, like, I'm just, I'm going to pray. So like, whatever. So I was praying and I remember I was like swearing and stuff while I was praying. Like I was, you know, just kind of talking to God and being like, can you please like do something? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, then I laid down, he was on the bunk above me and all of a sudden I had this feeling and this is, I, I didn't want anything to do with God. And all of a sudden I had this feeling where I was like, yo, can I pray for you? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I, I prayed for him. And again, it was just raw. I was, I was swearing. I was, you know, just doing what I, I don't even know what I was doing, to be honest. The next morning we woke up and this man looked at me and said, can I tell you something? And I said, yeah, sure. He's like, last night I was waiting for you to fall asleep because I was going to hang myself. And then all of a sudden, while I was thinking about this, you looked at me and said, can I pray for you? That's why I didn't do it. Oh. And looking back at that now, I'm just completely amazed because I rejected God. I didn't want anything to do with him. And that was the Holy Spirit just kind of, I'm going to take control here for a minute. So, oh, that is, wow, that is so powerful, Jacob. So you do make this commitment to the Lord, five o'clock in the morning, and, and we're kind of running out of time. So I want to talk about that, and I also want to talk about your cancer scares. So tell me about what happened at five o'clock one morning in your mom's home. So what happened then was, uh, actually, it was a realization of what happened prior to that. When I first started getting clean and actually seeking God, after like I was out of jail and stuff and I actually started seeking dr and enough was enough with the drugs and the lifestyle I was living. I didn't know how to read the Bible. Um, and I remember just picking it up and opening it up. And what I read was go to the plains, lay down and I will speak to you. And I was like, okay. I'm like, that's your word, God. And I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Right. So I know God's like, oh, that's cute. Like, so I closed the Bible. I put my coat on and it was nighttime. I walked down to the park and I was standing in the park and um, I, I was like, God, I'm here. Like your word said, go to the plains and I'll speak to you. I'm here. And I got pushed. There's no one in the park. I got pushed three times. And on the third time I fell flat on my back and all I seen was a flash of white. And I didn't know what that was. And I got up and I ran home and I never talked about it. Cause I was like, that was weird. So this five o'clock in the morning experience, and this was just last year, pretty much when I had this five o'clock in the morning experience, I was like, that came on my heart. I woke up at 5 AM and that came on my heart. And I was like, God, what was that? And he's like, that was me baptizing you with my Holy Spirit. Wow. And I just laid on the ground. I'm in my mom's living room, bawling my eyes out at 5 a.m. Because I just realized, like, how great are you? Like, I, I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve anything to do with that. Now, you had a, that's amazing. You had a health scare, though. 
Yeah. You were diagnosed eventually with stage four cancer. Yeah. You were cancer free. Tell me what happened. So the, for time's sake, what happened is I got diagnosed and this was after I got baptized and thought I made it through the storm. I was like, oh, I'm baptized, I'm saved, it's all clear, I'm clean, I'm doing the best I ever have done. Um, I got diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was stage two at first, and then none of the treatments were working. They cut me off chemo because it wasn't working. They did radiation. Radiation appeared to work, and then the day I was supposed to go in to get the results of being like, oh, you're all cleared up and stuff, I was at work and I just happened to throw my hand up under my armpit and I felt a lump and I knew what it was right away. And I went in the bathroom and just started crying. And I was like, like, God, is this it? Am I dying? Like, so I went into um, the doctors the next day and they told me what it was. They're like, the radiation cleared up the cancer in your neck, but the cancer breached the radiation and it's now stage four. It's under your armpits, in your abdominals, your liver. Like, you know, um, they started me off at a 95% success rate. And by this time it was 50-50. And they said, the only thing left that we can do is a stem cell transplant, uh, which we'll, we'll go ahead and book if, you have, if we have your consent. But the only way for that to work is your cancer has to be chemosensitive. And up until this point, it was not chemosensitive. So they're like, we're gonna try this new, this new chemo, this more potent chemo. I, re I wish I remember what it was called off by heart, but I don't, it had some weird uh, letters with it. Um, so they started me on this more potent chemo my cancer was still active. It was still, uh, still wasn't chemo sensitive. You know, it was still spreading. It was still like, there's no change. Um, one close to New Year's, my throat randomly swelled closed. So I couldn't swallow. Like I was trying to eat and even water. I was choking on water, just trying to drink water. So I go in and talk to my doctor and they're like, okay, we're gonna admit you into the oncology part of the hospital. Cause like we have to feed you, like you have to eat and drink right. to stay healthy through the treatment. So they ended up, um, saying we're not gonna give you chemo while you're in here because we don't know what this is. And if you're having an allergic reaction to the chemo, it doesn't make sense to give you more chemo, right? So uh, chemo stays in your system for 48 to 72 hours. The cycle I was on was I'd go in two days in a row for treatment and then um, uh, wait two weeks to, for your body to recover. So I was in the hospital at this point and I was about a week and a half with no chemo in my, uh, in my body at all and then I was laying in my bed and I remember I was so scared and I was reading Hebrews and I remember reading the verse of like faith is Hebrews 11, like mm -hmm. faith yeah. is believing yeah. in the things we cannot see. Yeah. And I honestly can't explain what happened. I, I say the Holy Spirit must have fell upon me because I just got this overwhelming courage to get up and just, you know what, God, you are my answer for this. You are, you've brought me through so much. You are my answer for this. Medicine's not working. You are my answer. I went in the bathroom. I started praying and I threw my hand up on my lump and I just started praying. And I've never said a prayer, like even to this day, I've never prayed the way I prayed that day. I don't know how to explain it. It's almost like it wasn't coming from me. It was late at night, I went to bed. I woke up the next morning and instantly, I don't know why, I just threw my hand up under my armpit and my lump was gone. And like, it was sticking out of my armpit. Like it was a very large, mm. noticeable lump and it was completely gone. I called the doctor in. I was like, my lump's gone. He's feeling up under my armpits and checking and stuff. Um, I was supposed to get a PET scan, like a PET scan, and I did not like getting those. And I was really praying like, Lord, is there a different way I can get this? So he said, okay, we're gonna just do a CAT scan to check it because we don't need to do a PET scan because it's clearly gone. So something clearly happened. Mm. They did the PET scan, the scan results came back and there was no lumps in my body anywhere. There was one spot in my liver that was um, a quarter of a fraction above what they would call abnormal. And they said, it's so small, we can't characterize it as anything. So medically though, you're in remission. Yes. You believe that God has healed you. Yes. And I know your mom, Kim, was praying and was just standing on God's word that you would be healed. Uh, Amy even went to the doctor, they did another CAT scan didn't find the cancer, you got the charts yeah. and the, and the uh, x-rays. It's an amazing story. I mean, so you've been physically healed, more importantly, spiritually healed. Yes. Thank you for sharing your story. No problem. Wow. And that's why we're here in 100 Huntley Street. And maybe you're one of the people right now that, you know, you need a touch from God. You need to have your body healed or you need to come into a relationship with Jacob. And his story is that he didn't want anything to do with God and yet God was still pursuing him. He's always pursuing us. We'll take a break and we'll be back with more of 100 Huntley Street.